Good morning, my Tedsters. How are we doing? Yeah. Is it just me? Or can you feel the buzz in the room today? I mean, there's a positive energy in this place to light up a football stadium. And I love it. Tremendous. Great speakers today, and I'm delighted to be here. There's not another place on the planet that I'd rather be than right here with you. There's one word that comes to mind when I think of today, and that is awesome, with a capital A. You see, when I was a young lad, about this high, my mother made a habit of saying me over and over that Sharon was caring. Sharon was caring. Would you guys be okay if we shared a little bit of awesome with you? Yeah. Would that be all right? All right, so what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to look to your left or your right. Make eye contact with someone. Give them a pretty smile. Give them a high five and tell them you're awesome! Give them some awesome! How'd that feel? Felt awesome, right? There's much more to that story, though. Because you got a homework assignment. For the next seven days, I don't care where you are on the globe, you need to share some awesome with one person who comes on your radar screen. I want you to make eye contact. Give them a pretty smile and give them some awesome. Can we do that? Yeah. So we're gonna, I just figured out today, we're gonna create a revolution. It's called Awesome Spreads. And you're all on board. And we're gonna do it. And at the end of those seven days, I want you to tweet me, or Facebook me, or LinkedIn me, or text me, or however you want to contact me, and let me know what it feels like to be a ripple of change. Because by virtue of you being here right now, I have a suspicion that you want to make things better. You want to improve things, right? You want to put your footprint on the planet. And that is just so noble. But be warned, because as you step forward on the edge, right, and avoid status quo, there's going to be those folks who come out of nowhere, like Freddy Krueger in some bad rendition of Nightmare on Elm Street, they are going to start chirping in your ear. You're crazy. Don't do it. You don't have the resources. <laughs> Wait till next year when everything's better before or after the election. The summers when everything is when we change stuff, right? You know those folks? They come out of nowhere. They're dream killers. So as I stand here right now, look at all of you right now. I can see those thought balloons above some of your heads. Is he talking about me? How does he know? <laughs> Am I the thought balloon whisperer? Woo! You see, I've been fascinated with this whole concept of change my entire life. It was only yesterday that my father would literally read me snippets of speeches from John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and a host of others. And I was so absolutely enthralled that one group, one movement, one team, one person could be the catalyst for change. So in my short time here today, I'm going to talk to you about something that's near and dear to my heart. Is your DNA your destiny? Now you're probably wondering why I have a backpack on. <laughs> <laughs> You think I have a fascination with backpacks, right? Maybe I just, that's just my, as you say, that's how I roll, right? I'm the backpack guy. Not really. You see, this backpack has been a constant companion most of my life. Because I was so uncomfortable being me. I looked for everyone else to validate and confirm and tell me that it was okay. 
So what would I do with all those inauthentic experiences and all that stuff? I'd go off in the backyard and I'd dig a hole and dig a hole and try to bury all that stuff, all that emotional baggage. But the hole was never big enough. And all that stuff just kept coming along with me year after year. And the backpack got bigger and heavier. And I've been carrying it around because I never felt comfortable in my own skin. You so, I mean, if you had a different set of DNA, you had a different set of parents, you'd be smarter, faster, prettier, more athletic. You'd have all the things that you ever wanted if you just had a different set of parents, maybe, right? I mean, you may even be a movie star. I mean, that Angelina Jolie is so lucky. Her parents are movie stars. Her husband's a movie star. She's a freaking movie star. I mean, look at those lips, this DNA thing. The genetic lottery is just not fair. Life is not fair. But maybe it's not a DNA thing, right? Maybe it's a circumstance thing. I mean, if you could just lose those 15 pounds from freshman year, everyone would see the real you that's been hiding inside you for so long that you could go to the beach or the pool and take off that cover-up because you don't want people to see that you. If you were just a little bit smarter, you'd smoke the competition and everyone loves a winner. And your whole life you were just so close to being a winner. God, just so close. I mean, look at Ronnie and Sarah. I mean, they've got, oh, look at that marriage. Did you see the Christmas card? Mmm, just look so happy. Everyone loves Sarah. I mean, she's on the PTA. She hangs out with the cool moms on Tuesdays for coffee at Starbucks. I wish I could be Sarah. But look at Ronnie. Ronnie's so comfortable as a husband. He actually shows PDA. He comes on his son's class and he's present. I just want a marriage like Ronnie and Sarah. If you had just gotten into Cal or Stanford or Harvard or Colgate, oh, your life would be different. You see, you'd have that promotion right now. You'd be making that six-figure salary. You'd have the German automobile. You'd have the condo in Palm Springs. And you, too, would get to go on that Hawaiian spring break vacation like all the other families do at your school. But you had just gotten in to Harvard, Colgate, Stanford, or Cal. But we all have our reasons why our lives aren't perfect, don't we? Those things that just keep us from being the best that we can be. At least, I thought so. But we get that a great life is about connections. It's about relationships that are based on a foundation of trust and mutual respect. Where you can get vulnerable and let people in. And it's real and it's substantive. And it means something. And if I can do it with one person, then I can do it with two people and three. And then we start to build the foundation of a community that's alive and vibrant and changing things. And we're bound by something that's much bigger than ourselves. And as the group gets bigger and bigger, we let one person in, and unbeknownst to us, She's been eating a souffle her entire life of toxicity and negativity. And she utters this word. She, oh, don't you say it. She utters that word. And that word is impossible. And as it comes out of her mouth, you can see progress. And everyone looks around. And self-doubt creeps in. Are we really the ones to do this? Is now the right time? Do we have enough peace? 
resources, do we? This backpack is heavy. But see, I know a little bit about the word impossible. I was fed it in an overstuffed sandwich most of my life. It was an acquired taste, but one that never soothed my palate. You see, I was born in 1969 in Washington, D.C. to a black father and a white mother. Approximately two years after the Supreme Court legalized interracial marriage in America. My father was born in Mullins, South Carolina, 1934. Ninth grade dropout, spent time in prison, got kicked out of the military, suffered from bipolar disorder, and was an alcoholic. My mother, 17 years his junior, fell in love with my father, graduated from high school, had me shortly thereafter, and it literally had me run from the segregated South to escape. But there was this little secret that we never talked about. You see, my mom's dad, my grandfather, he was in this little group that occasionally liked to take a cross and burn it on your front yard, and they dress up in white sheets. So he wasn't too thrilled about that union. And by the way, my mom, she had a little addiction issue my entire childhood. So I know a little something about impossible, right? So in the interim, it feels only like yesterday that I was coming into school, five years old. I'm holding my dad's hand, just so nervous and excited to go to kindergarten. And we walk up to the teacher. The teacher looks up, looks down. Looks up, looks down at me and says, is your mother here? The judgment could have sliced a dinner roll. It felt like a thousand paper cuts whoosh, right down the middle of my back. That was an experience. It was tough stuff and one that I was all too familiar with. But in the interim, what did I do? I coped. I pretended. I just gave you everything that you wanted to see. I thought, to get the mood, I would be this. But always in this constant flux, this limbo. Am I black? Because I hang around black friends all in a black neighborhood? Or am I white because of the color of my skin? You see, this shifting chameleon life between black and white to avoid judgment had halted my growth for years. <laughs> You see, folks, I was hiding. I might as well have been in the witness protection program. And if you're not present and you're not real, the relationships are disingenuous and you are not living. Now, sometimes I firmly believe that if you don't have the courage to move forward, life moves forward for you. My mother passed away in the hospital because of her addiction issues. So I had time to take a deep dive. And what I found is I had a gift. When I was 12 years old, my father sat me in the car, a Buick. And he said, son, take your hand, put it on the dial. I would you like this song? No. And I changed the dial and I changed the dial. He said, I want to tell you a story. Songs are like your thoughts. 24 hours a day, there's songs going on that radio, right? Yeah, dad, I get it. Well, so you, you head to, there's thoughts, right? Yes. Well, I want you to do something. Next time you have a negative thought, I want you to change the dial. So you change the song. You like that song, turn off the volume. And he connected those dots. I had no idea what he was talking about at the time, but at 30 years old, I lit up like a Christmas tree. I got it. So 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day, wow. I can become what I think about. I can be what I think about. Is this who I'm truly to be? So I started analyzing my thoughts, recognizing patterns, journaling, writing it down, acknowledging, becoming aware of it, and getting a lot of rid of that negative self-talk that had been in this backpack for too long. I got comfortable being me. So you're probably wondering what all this stuff is about these inner thoughts and all this stuff. You see, because what I've found is that regardless of your station in life, whether you grew up in Beverly Hills or the Bronx, 
we're all the same. Those inner voices, those demons, those self-doubt, we carry it with us from childhood. Now I firmly believe, in my heart of hearts, that there's something for each of us to do, and if we do not do it, it will not get done. So many of us are waiting for someone to tell us it's okay. Give me a hall pass. Tell me I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be risky. Just tell me, validate me, confirm me, all that stuff. It's never okay until you make it okay. If you want more, you have to be more. If you want things to have to improve, you have to improve. But start right here. You're not going to change anything until you change this. Now you can either find a way, or you can find an excuse. If you're looking for someone to tap you on your shoulder, I just did. So what are we going to do about it? Thank you.